Hi, I'm Travis and this is Curious Tangents, and your cerebellum is often referred to as the oldest part of the brain. It contains more than 50% of the cells in the brain but only takes up about 10% of the space. And you may not have one. These are some of my favorite psychology facts. The cerebellum is the more densely detailed portion of the brain seen here in my friend Hannah's painting. A 24-year-old woman was once admitted into a hospital for dizziness and nausea. She had lived a relatively regular life, although she learned how to speak later than most children. When admitted into the hospital, they gave her brain scans, and they found that her entire cerebellum was missing. This is called cerebroagenesis, a very rare condition where babies are born without their cerebellums. In part because of this condition, we know that the cerebellum doesn't control your movement as it was once thought to do. The motor cortex does that. The cerebellum just refines your ability to move. Schizophrenia is a mental illness in which a person experiences visual, audio, or occasionally topographical or touch hallucinations. The most frequently depicted version of schizophrenia is an audio-verbal hallucination, or hearing voices. If a deaf person has schizophrenia, however, they will still report hearing voices. Alzheimer's is a disease which causes progressive memory loss, caused by amyloid beta plaques which build up within the brain. These plaques interfere with the firing of neurons, which causes a lot of problems. If you're a person like me who is terrified of getting a neurological disease, then you will be happy to know that one of the things that you can do to best protect yourself from developing Alzheimer's is also one of the things that is most related to living a fulfilling life. And that is to form healthy relationships. Humanity is the social species. And studies show that people who have fulfilling relationships tend to develop Alzheimer's at a lower rate. Speaking of memory, we have a slight obsession with attempting to reduce the amount of memory held by the human brain into bytes, or bits of data that computers can process. So far, the estimate stands at about 2.5 petabytes, or 1 million gigabytes. Whether or not we can actually quantify human experiences into computer data is unknown. But thinking of the brain this way has led to a bit of a distortion. You see, when you remember something, your brain doesn't just pull it out of a file folder in the back of your head. What is actually happening is that the neurons in your brain are firing in a similar way to what they did when you actually experienced whatever you're remembering. Furthermore, there is always a distortion between what your brain is recreating when you remember versus what happened the first time that you experienced something. And you will probably never notice it unless reality demands that you do. False memories. One of the reasons why eyewitness testimonies are not nearly as trustworthy as the average person tends to believe. Immediately after an event, the brain may remember things as they happened. However, if given time, the brain will tend to remember things as a story which it prefers. Today, we compare brains to computers as seen in a previous example. However, if this were the 1700s, we would probably be comparing brains to steam engines. And if this were ancient Rome, we would be comparing our brains to irrigation systems. Throughout history, we have tended to compare the brain to whatever technology is dominant at the time. Today, that is computers, and maybe it will be computers for the rest of time. Or maybe it's silly to think that computing power is the last great invention. Maybe. It's often said that our attention spans have shrunk so much since the year 2000 that they are now shorter than that of a goldfish, about nine seconds. There are many problems with thinking about attention in this way. Attention is a complicated thing, something that shouldn't be reduced down to a simple span of time. One of the problems with the studies that cite this is that they equate the memory of a goldfish to the attention span of a goldfish, and memory and attention are not the same thing. Secondly, goldfish are only rumored to have short memories. The actual memory of a goldfish is thought to be at least five months long, and most importantly, attention is not a single thing. You are paying selective attention to me right now. You're probably browsing through other videos on YouTube while I play in the background, and that's fine. Just don't click away. As a bonus, if you're watching the screen right now, you've probably noticed this Rubik's Cube. However, you probably didn't notice that that Rubik's Cube has been changed several times throughout the video, and the reason that you didn't notice it is because your brain deems it irrelevant. 
because it's a Rubik's Cube and it doesn't really matter for the video. However, the number of things that your brain can deem irrelevant is rather amazing, but for a different time. Saying that the amount of information in the world has increased exponentially is an understatement. Never have you needed to know more in order to be relevant than in 2020. The invention of and early interactions with digital technology has led to brains that process information differently than did those of generations previous. How differently this is quantifiably, we don't yet know. One of the least understood terms often thrown around in psychology is the unconscious mind. In fact, the unconscious is talked about so vaguely that my understanding is often insufficient. A really fun test to demonstrate this, if I ask you what the capital of France is, you'll probably say or think Paris. And you'll be right, but why? You didn't choose to think up that answer you just had it. This is your declarative memory working. If I ask you where you live, you obviously know the answer, but you don't need to decide to know the answer. There's no conscious effort that goes into this. Your declarative memory knows things without you having any input. Working out can be difficult. A lot of us don't even want to think about it. In a study published in the Journal of Neurophysiology, two groups of participants were told to work out four times a week for four weeks, or to sit down for 11 minutes and think about working out. The first group who actually worked out after the four weeks seen an increase in strength, but the second group did as well. But what's even more cool than that is that by the end of that study, the second group who did mental exercises had stronger brains as well. And what I mean by that is that the neuromuscular pathways or your brain's ability to communicate with your body had improved in the group who visualized exercising. This has a few far-reaching implications. Professional athletes regularly go through great length in order to visualize themselves performing their prospective sports. Nearly 30 years ago, in the 1990s, a group of graduate students was looking into the brains of macaque monkeys, and one of those students just happened to be eating when they noticed that the brain of this macaque lit up in the areas associated with eating, the premotor region of the frontal cortex. The monkey itself was not moving. The specific neurons lighting up in the brain of that macaque were called mirror neurons. These are all over the less reputable parts of the internet. Despite what some articles may say, these do not appear to give us superpowers. In fact, they may not even be the basis of empathy, which is what they would appear to be. However, they probably do make you a really good learner, especially in terms of learning via observation. Human beings are generally empathetic creatures. If someone else is in pain, then you generally feel some amount of pain yourself. If an animal is struggling, then you relate to it. When you observe someone doing something, your brain lights up in a way that is similar to you doing it. This is also seen with other types of emotions. Someone else coming up to you and being happy makes you happy, which is why happy people are generally kind of addictive. Similarly, seeing sadness is contagious. Why we are not entirely sure, but the answer is probably tribalism. And that's for a later video. And this is probably number 11, although the algorithm demands that this video says, my top 10 favorite psychology facts. And so this is number 10. You, my dear viewer watching this, are a conscious being, though we don't really know what consciousness is. We've got a great idea and we may know it intuitively, but we can't really objectify it. On top of that, we don't know what part of the brain consciousness comes from, or if consciousness is actually in an individual part of the brain, or if consciousness emerges from different parts of the brain working together. We have made many strides in the way of artificial intelligence, and not a single step towards artificial consciousness points to the idea that consciousness may not be a single thing. You, the self that you identify with, the individual that you are, may be multiple. Due to the emergence of some new research, the questions that we're asking are starting to appear wrong. The self that you identify with, the individual that you are, may not exist the way that you think of it. Benjamin Libet did a simple and famous experiment where he simply had people 
decide to press a button. He also measured brain activity as they made this decision. And what they found is, well, to put into the best way that I can, the brain decides to press the button far before you do. You are not one, but two, or maybe even more. The amount of things making decisions that are not a part of you consciously is surprising. We like to think or tell ourselves that the decisions that we make are all a part of our conscious choices, though all of the evidence is against that idea. There is underlying influence to everything we do. Bonus fact, if you like this video, you should not only subscribe, but also hit the bell. Because I run a variety channel, YouTube doesn't really show you the videos because YouTube's algorithm doesn't really favor variety. It kind of just shows you the exact same type of video over and over again. And I generally vary my video topics a lot, so if you would like to see more of me, then you probably have to hit the bell to do so. Patreon and Discord links in the description. Also, huge thank you to Juice who made this fan art of me. And to Jacqueline who made this fan art of me. If you're ever wondering if you can make me fan art or want to send me fan mail, uh, email is in the description. Until then, thank you for watching.